Hello everyone, I'm delighted to be joined here today by Kim Knight, who is a health and personal development coach specializing in chronic health conditions, emotional healing and transformation of consciousness. For the past 25 years, she's followed two pathways simultaneously. One is the healing route to identify the root cause of illness. And the other side is consciousness, spirituality, and learning from many wonderful enlightened teachers. So first of all, Kim, thank you for joining me here today. Thank you for inviting me. I, I always start um, the interviews with the same question because I think it's really an inspiring, um, inspiring for others to hear. Um, anything about your background that you'd like to share, but when was that awakening moment for you? And what I mean by that is whatever it means for you, but the realization that the world is not the way that we thought it was. Well, actually, I would say that I've got three layers of answering that question. Uh, I can, what comes to mind is three distinct times that I can say I, I, there was a big, big awareness change. The first was when I was about 25, I was living in the UK at the time. And I just remember thinking, I'm sure there's more to life than, than just going to school, going to university, getting a job, getting married, having 2.2 children and a white picket fence, because that was really what I thought life was about. And I can't even remember the circumstances now around why I started to think that, but I definitely started to think, I, I, I don't think I fit into that mold even though my parents, my family were trying very hard to, to, to put me in that mold. And then the second stage, if you like, was, was actually a huge thing and, and it was an awakening experience, although I didn't know that's what it was at the time. And it started with a, a, going into a, a very bad depression into clinical depression and I didn't even know initially that I was depressed um, somebody said to me I think you're depressed and I didn't even know what the word was or what it meant and I said what's that <laughs> and they tried to explain it and then I, I found myself going to see a counsellor and starting to talk about these things called feelings uh, that I'd never thought of or really you know felt or heard about and then starting to discover that actually I wasn't as happy as I thought I was. And that then progressed into the depression worsening because it's like, you know, when you lift your open Pandora's box, then stuff starts coming out and things have to get worse to get better. And of course, I didn't really understand that at the time. I just knew that I was spiraling down into a very deep, dark place and ended up in hospital. <clears throat> excuse me it was through my choice through I wasn't sort of committed or anything but um, my counsellor said I, I think you should take a break and go go into this specialist facility and it was a very nice facility in London uh, and I was there for a couple of weeks and in that in that time I just continued to spiral down and down and down into what just felt like this never-ending pit of darkness where there was no light at the end of the tunnel, as they say. And interestingly enough, they wanted to give me medication, antidepressants, and I took them for one day. It made me feel even worse and I refused to take any more. And I just lay in bed, spiraling literally into this dark hole and then uh, and, and trying to fight my way out of it. It was like I was trying to get out because it didn't feel good, but it wasn't working. And then one day I just surrendered I just surrendered to the darkness and fell down and through and then came out the other side. It felt like I literally was going through the earth and coming out the other side of the planet. And from that moment on, I started to uh, feel better. Uh, so I hadn't, tr you know, done anything except surrendered. <clears throat> and and it was a very strange time because I couldn't read, I couldn't watch television, I could hardly speak, 
I felt like everything was breaking down inside my head, inside my mind, inside what was normally, you know, going on in my head and mind. And it took me several years to, to work out what had actually happened. And what I believe happened was that there was a breaking down of my consciousness to rebuild something new or to replace with something new. Uh, and, and the metaphor that I always use is that if you have a, an old building that you want to demolish uh, uh, because you want to build a new skyscraper, you have to demolish the old building first and it gets very messy for a while. You know, you drive past a building site for months and it just looks like a building site. And then one day you drive past and there's a brand new shiny skyscraper. And and that that is what I feel happened. But it took several years to, for, for that transition and, and integration to, to happen. And it was only when several years later I was on a one of my very first spiritual courses and I can't even remember what was being said or talked about at the time, but I just had this recognition of like, oh, I, I had a quite a significant transformation of consciousness. And during that time, that those several years, I started to see things differently and I started to, for example, look outside the mainstream medical system for the health problems I was experiencing and started, uh, you know, really exploring mm -hmm. in a deep way different natural natural therapies. And at the time, I've tried hundreds of, of therapies. Um, and, and then obviously getting into spiritual, learning spiritual aspects. And then I would say the third level of awakening has actually just been in the last three years. <clears throat> since the, the pandemic um, hit uh, and really waking up to, wow, the world is not what I thought it was. There's a whole level of corruption and deceit uh, and planned agendas, one could say, of, of a nefarious nature that I never knew existed. And it's all connected, all these different uh, industries and areas of life uh, you know, whether you call it, you know, big agriculture, big tech, big banking, big oil, uh, that, wow, it's all interconnected. Big pharma, big medicine, big, big education. It's like, whoa, and th there's there's something going on here and it's been going on for a long time. And I've been walking around in the world, you know, just going on holiday, going to work, seeing my friends, thinking, well, this is what life is about. And actually, whoa, there's something bigger going on. So that that is that has been an interesting time the last three years. This interview could go in so many directions. <laughs> you said at the beginning you went into this depression and you didn't realize that you were in the depression. You didn't realize that you were not happy. And then this took you through this experience. What happened to me was when I was growing up, when I was... Um, in my teenage years is I had suicidal ideation, I call it, because I didn't actually want to kill myself. I just used to imagine um, that I didn't want to be here. I wanted to go back where I came from and uh, used to express that through poetry and writing at the time. Um, but it was really, I was in a deep depression and I've often wondered about what was the root cause of it. Um, and I've explored that, um, and it could be something to do with parents, but I also just have a, a general feeling that nothing that I saw out there made sense to me at the time. That was, that, that's my reason that I feel that I was, um, depressed was because I saw, uh, girls getting pregnant when they were kind of 12 12 13 years old working class England Nottinghamshire I won't say exactly where and uh, people walking around with baseball bats on a Friday night and cars being stolen and people having no dreams or aspirations and as I was growing up I actually thought to myself this isn't what I want this doesn't make sense to me so anyway I'm just wondering if you have uh, a route for where it came from for you the way I understand depression now, uh, and I find this quite a fascinating description that I learned from one of my teachers, is that depression is the depressing of emotions. So depression, te people tend to 
to uh, describe depression as an emotion, but actually it's more a symptom and underneath the symptoms are emotions. So what are the emotions that we're depressing? And usually it has a lot to do with frustration or sadness, hurt, um, these, these sort of things. So, yes, I did do deep, deep dive exploration into why was I experiencing this depression? Because in order to clear it at a fundamental root level, which is what I like doing, I like getting those roots out. You pull the roots out that that plant doesn't grow anymore. Uh, I, I, I really had to explore and to add in, which will help that this explanation, I thought I was get. I mean, I was, I got through that and I started to get back into life and, and I thought I was, you know, and I, I was having counseling and I, and, and I was starting to deal with my past and the unhappiness and, you know, frustration of whatever of the past, but actually I wasn't really fully dealing with it properly, um, and several years later, I was diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome. And that led to 10 years of looking for solutions for that. And 10 years of that nearly of not being able to work and all the consequences of that. Uh, and that led me on a huge, huge uh, journey of discovery because I, I went to so many therapists, they couldn't help. Of course, doctors saying, we don't know what causes it, there's no solution. And that led me down a big rabbit hole of exploring a wide range of really funky natural therapies. And I got to, again, a turning point in that after searching and searching and searching where I finally found what I call the missing piece. And at that point, I'd got to America and I had found my way to who, um, this man who became my first Qigong teacher. And he said, well, the good news is, uh, what did he say? He said that the good news is that you, you have a lot of energy, even though I literally crawled into his office. And he said, the bad news is you're using all your energy to hold that energy inside. And specifically what you're holding inside is all your emotions. And at that point, I just burst into tears and wailed and howled for an hour uh, because I was ripe and ready to let this pain out. And that then started to, to lead me. That was really the start of learning about the enormous power of emotional energy to, to create havoc emotionally, mentally, and physically. And because I'd been using all my energy to hold in my emotional energy because emotions are a form of energy. So from that moment on, I started learning these techniques to clear trapped emotional energy from inside the body and, and literally from inside different organs because different emotions gravitate towards different organs. For example, we say I was livid with anger. Why do we say that? Because the liver... Uh, both generates uh, and holds and is affected by by anger. And so I, I started learning the, this, this particular meditation um, for clearing different emotional toxins from inside the organs because they, they are toxic. Uh, so anger, hurt, sadness, grief, fear, um, you know, all these types of, you know, hatred, betrayal, what, whatever. And as I did that, I started to, as that energy started to clear, the depression started to lift, the chronic fatigue started to lift. So I'm not going to go into too much of my personal story of, you know, what happened in my past, but the bottom line was, was that I was not happy growing up, but I didn't know it. Uh, I, because we, it's funny, we, we're not aware of what we're not aware of, and we forget things and become unconscious to protect ourselves emotionally. Um, but I had a lot of built up, uh, unexpressed, unresolved emotions and emotional pain from my childhood. And, and eventually that had built up and become symptoms. And I also believe that there are probably past life effects as well. But unless you have memory, you know, specific memories of that, one doesn't know what that is. But, you know, we bring with us, you know, what, what we've experienced from other lives. So when I do, this isn't to talk about me now, by the way, it's linked to what you were saying. 
But when I do the hypnotherapy, the first thing that I do, because it's the most powerful, is I ask people to release any negative images, feelings, thoughts, emotions, or sensations that are stored in the body, trapped in the body. And I actually learned this technique from Carl Smith at the UK Hypnosis Academy, and he did it for PTSD. And he had, somebody had done the same thing where you just let it all out. And then he said that, you know, this um, it's like a, the, the lid had been taken off and then he was crying for about an hour in a pub. And um, so it was actually for PTSD. And so the thing is like, yeah, when you release that stored stuff, it has so many different positive effects are uh, psychosomatic. So can be physical, can be emotional. Um, but it's, yeah, it's so important. Um, so maybe you'd like to comment on that. And also when you describe that end state where you felt like everything was being bro broken down, was that also would you because you know in enlightenment people talk about you know the the losing of the ego so you 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 would come back and you wouldn't identify yourself as kim knight anymore um well two very very different questions yeah so the from an emo the emotions point of view one of the things that i've learned um is that the thing that emotions most need in order to transform and remembering that energy cannot be destroyed, but it can be transformed, is it? they need to be validated. They need to be acknowledged. They need to be accepted. And of course, most people are un unconsciously going around trying to suppress, avoid, push under the carpet, deny, uh, swallow, you know, all these words that we use. Um, you know, I couldn't swallow that. Um, and interestingly enough, our digestive system, uh, well, actually every cell tissue and organ in our body have a dual function. They, they don't just have a physical function, they have a metaphysical function. And this has all been mapped. It's very, very fascinating. It's been mapped precisely that every, you know, you could talk about your kidney tubules or, uh, the, you know, certain layers of uh, muscle tissue in a certain organ. Uh, every cell tissue and organ in the body uh, have a metaphysical function to manage emotional energy if it's not properly cleared consciously by the person, that those tissues and organs will hold that energy until it's ready to be cleared or dissipated. Uh, in other words, until we're ready to sort of face it and, and heal. Um, and so our digestive system, for example, digests food. You know, we take in, we, we chew food, we swallow it, it, the body digests it and then we eliminate the waste well our digestive system quite literally has to do the same thing with our emotional life we have to digest our emotional life and if we don't then then um that that energy gets stuck somewhere along the digestive system and i remember um, early on when i started working as a practitioner uh working with a lady who had uh her, her mother had died very suddenly when, when she was young. Um, I mean, she, her mother was ill in hospital, but it wasn't very unexpected that she would die. And she walked in one day to visit her and, and the nurse said, oh, you, your mother died. And she she was 73, this lady, when I saw her. And so she was, was born in an era where you, uh, you don't talk about your emotions, you don't talk about your feelings, you don't show your feelings, you just hold it all inside. And so she just held that shock and that sadness inside. Uh, and then 40 years later, um, she's in hospital for three months, having in excruciating abdominal pain. And, and, and the doctors are doing every test under the sun. And this is so common for people. You know, I hear this from clients so often. I've, I've had all these tests and nothing is showing up physically wrong. And so she somehow she found her, her way to me because at the time I was doing a technique uh, called Chinet Sang ab Abdominal Massage, which is incredible for um, helping the body release um, emotions from the, the organs. Uh, and, and all of a sudden this memory came up of, her, of when she'd been told that her mother had died, and, but she'd never, you know, acknowledged that pain at the time. And in the moment that the memory came up during the session, she 
and and she'd been in hospital as I said for three months in agonizing pain and they hadn't found anything I mean three months is a long time right and they hadn't found anything and in that moment the pain disappeared so emotions need to be validated and recognized and then we need to have the tools to self-clear and self-process emotional energy and the problem is most people are afraid of facing their feelings because we don't like how these feelings feel but they're not meant to feel good because they're meant to uh, alert us to the fact that something needs dealing with so they're not meant to feel good but that doesn't mean that we have to stay in pain for weeks and months and years emotionally you know we don't have to stay depressed for years uh, we can actually, once we learn, you know, for example, tapping is, I, I think, one of the most useful techniques for beginners. Yeah, and we can clear emotional pain in literally seconds and minutes when we know how. And the more proficient we become at using these techniques, the quicker we can clear that emotional energy. So I've spent 20 years deep diving into emotions and how to clear emotions. And actually, this leads me then on to the next question um, about mm -hmm. Um, you know, the I can't remember how you phrased it, but you know, talking about ego, ego dropping and um, you know, what unity consciousness type stuff, enlightenment is that as from, from the spiritual studies that I've done for the past 25 years, really understanding that the human being, I, I like to, to call us a five star human, so we have the physical body the mind, which is a lot of different things that, you know, it could be memories, um, consciousness, um, programming, conditioning. Uh, there's, there's a lot that goes, in, you know, into what the mind is. Uh, but physical body, mind, emotions, energy, which is often not talked about as well in the Western world, but it is in, in Chinese medicine, uh, which, which is what I've studied a reasonable amount, uh, and then spirit. And... Um, it's essentially, as far as I understand it, we're, we're here in duality consciousness, uh, working our way towards unity consciousness, uh, where where there is a, a very, very um, profound shift in consciousness to move properly from unity consciousness to, uh, sorry, from duality consciousness to unity consciousness. Uh, but that that doesn't happen. Well, for some people, it can happen straight away, but that usually is because then they've a lot of things have happened in previous lives to prepare them. Otherwise, it happens in increments. So looking back for me, uh, and often we can't understand what's happened to us until we look back, you know, this, you, you know, when you've been through something and you come out the other side and, and then you integrate and then you look back and you go, oh, okay, I understand now what happened. Um, so for me, it was that was just an awakening, but it wasn't an awakening into unity consciousness. I'm, I'm not there yet, but it was an awakening that set me on the path to wanting to find out more. And I remember it probably was around that time walking into a, a bookshop in London, and and I and and I just sort of found myself walking towards this section on spiritual stuff, which I'd never done before. And picking this little book off a shelf, it was just a little book, very small, um, about, I think it was either the I Ching or the Tao Te Ching, I can't remember which, probably the Tao Te Ching. And I picked it off the, 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 uh, the bookshelf and opened it up and I, and I was just fascinated by what it was, but I didn't understand a thing. It was written in English, but I could have been written reading Japanese. You know, it didn't mean anything, but for some reason... I was really drawn to this book and I bought it. <laughs> and it was about 10 years later that I picked it off my bookshelf again and went, oh, okay, I get it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I don't know if that answers your, your questions. It does, it does. Um, okay, we're back. We've just, uh, we've just sorted out the lighting. So. Yes, I was looking very orange. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so the, the, what, there was one more bit that I was going to add was so that we've got this, we're, we're this five-star human and we're on a journey to, to evolve and transform our consciousness from duality to unity consciousness. And in order to do that, there's one word really that describes, could describe what we have to do. We, we have to purify ourselves. There are many other things too, but purify is a good word. We have to purify our physical body 
So that means, you know, eating good food, drinking good water, of course, you know, not clogging our body up with uh, toxic food, which, of course, is getting harder and harder with all the crap that's in the supermarkets and the pesticides and herbicides and, you know, all that sort of stuff. But anyway, we need to purify our physical body. Uh, we need to purify our mind, which really means working on our consciousness and clearing um, what in Ren Shui we call the, the, the unhealthy patterns of consciousness. Um, then we have to purify our emotions, which means clearing out this garbage, uh, this, this backlog of, of emotional energy, which has been stored in our body and learning how to to take care of ourselves emotionally on a, on a moment to moment basis. And any time we notice that we've, we've lost our good, natural, healthy, uplifted state, you know, any time we notice that we're not feeling good emotionally, we have to do something about it straight away, uh, uh, purify ourselves and build ourselves energetically so that we're not constantly draining our energy, which most people are doing unconsciously, but instead uh, preserving our energy and enhancing and building uh, the quality and quantity of our chi, our energy, and then of course uh, grow ourselves, and that that in a way we could say will result in us uh, growing ourselves spiritually, because our natural state is to be you know a spiritual being, but if we've got all this other stuff in the way, it prevents us being our true self, who we truly are. We talked before the before the interview started about the importance of uh, spirituality and the final part of your awakening journey that you described was the last three years when we just, you know, when you found out just how connected everything is and how everything's interlinked and all of this. And so my question is then to, to kind of bring it back down a bit to that next stage where you've got working everything out, watching the documentaries, um, looking at things which, 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 are, which are negative, which are, uh, you know, which make us feel um, uncomfortable. We might have feelings that, you know, we're all doomed at this stage if it's going to be like this. So you've got that side of things. Um, and then you've also got the side of things which is doing all this, uh, work on emotions and body and mind and, and what you've just described so what about the people then that are watching this that are also joining the dots which is also what you said you've been doing but also perhaps also uh, feeling like we need to fight we're in a war with and and with this uh, kind of thing going on sorry what's the the question in a nutshell the question in a nutshell is um, how how do you marry the two? The, the doing all of this inner work and also joining the dots together, looking at what's going on in the world. Yeah, so it's interesting because in the in this series that I'm working on at the moment, what what I feel is that there are three layers to the problem, so to speak. There's the outer manifested problem of wow, so we've got, you know, environmental breakdown, climate problems, food problems, you know, this, that, the other problems, you know, people wanting to have us live in a, in a virtual reality universe called the metaverse, uh, people wanting to put chips into our brains and, and augment us because, you know, that's the only way to do it. There's all this stuff happening, which I call the problem. It's like the, the end result. Um, <clears throat> but underneath that is, well, why? Why is that actually happening? And, you know, th this, and I can't really fully uh, uh, answer the question here because it's just too big a question to answer, but it is what we're going to be doing, deep diving in, in into this series, which is why it's taken me so long to, to put it together because it just blows my mind to try and come to grips with understanding it all. Um, but in order to understand, it's the same with illness. It's like in order to understand why we have a physical problem, we've got to look for the metaphysical reasons. 
and 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 so it's exactly the same thing with the world because the world is a is a macrocosm of of a microcosm of you know a person we could say is a microcosm just one person but the collective is the is the collective version of all the all, all the individual humans is that we we've got to get to the roots of the problem and so we do need to well, I, I don't know whether we say we do need to or whether it's useful to understand how all the bits of the picture fit together, both on a physical plane level, in other words, what's happening out there in the world, but also on a deeper esoteric metaphysical level, um, which which comes back to separation, you know, separation and duality, polarity. Uh, a lot of people are in polarity of right and wrong, good and bad, this shouldn't be happening, that person shouldn't be doing that, this is wrong, etc. But that is still polarity and duality. And our job is to reach this higher state of consciousness, which is unity consciousness, which, uh, you know, there are many words for, for it, you know, enlightenment. And again, that's a loaded word for some people that will mean one thing and somebody else it will mean another. But in the truest spiritual sense, it is a state where one is in a, a unity consciousness state where there is no you or me. Now I'm not in that in that place, so I can't fully understand what that is, and one cannot understand from what I've learned, you know, from people who who are enlightened when they try and describe what that is. They say you you cannot understand it until you get there, and when you get there, one of the things my te- my qigong teacher has said is that life begins anew, and it is a you're like in a completely different world, but you're still on the planet. So we can't, we just can't grasp or imagine what it is like until one has, you know, is in that that state. And I like to liken self-realization to a ladder. So if you imagine a ladder with lots of rungs, and every time we move our consciousness in in an upward way, we're going up a rung of the ladder. And the first, and then occasionally you'll get to a major step on the ladder, like a big wide step, uh, but there are more rungs above that. But the first major step on the ladder is this place of unity consciousness um, uh, and, and, and enlightenment. And so whilst we, we need to maybe understand, you know, what's going on, the most important thing to do is to be doing the inner work, whatever exercises or techniques we we learn, you know, that we come across to move ourselves towards this state of unity consciousness. Um, and, and for me, I was first introduced to this, really started yeah, learning about this thing called enlightenment when I um, came across Kriya Yoga. So a lot of people may have heard of, uh, of the book Autobiography of a Yogi by Paramahansa Yogananda. And I read that book, I don't know, in the early 2000s, some, somewhere around that time. And, and I remember in the book, it kept on mentioning Kriya Yoga, Kriya Yoga, Kriya Yoga. And I was saying, what is this Kriya Yoga? And, and then in 2004, I was going through another difficult time mm-hmm. And usually when we're going through a difficult time, then we start searching for answers, you know, to solve our problems. And uh, and I found, I read an article in a magazine, in you know, locally and, and discovered that there was a Kriya Yoga um, teaching locally. And I went along and, and, and got um, initiated. Uh, and we have to be careful with that word. Some people can think that's a negative word. But again, that's that's a whole other conversation about how words can be misused and abused. Uh, so I, I was initiated in, into Kriya Yoga, and that is a meditation technique for moving one towards, you know, unity consciousness. And I remember in the book, reading the book, and I, funnily enough, I just started reading it again. I got it out of my storage unit. And uh, <clears throat> and one of the things that Yogananda says, and his teacher, Sri, actually his teacher, Sri Yukteswar, repeats over and over again, uh, is that, the most important thing to do in one's daily life is one's meditation practice. Uh, you know, Qigong is a form of meditation as well. People don't seem to realize that. It's, but the whole point of meditation is to bring one inwards, to bring the senses inwards. So because our sense, usually we're outwards, we're, going, we're looking, 
we're hearing, we're talking, we're in the external world. We have to bring our attention back inwards and, and still the mind through whatever technique we're using. And that allows us to access these deeper levels of our being, whatever word one wants to use. Some people say soul, spirit, true self, whatever, you know, whatever higher self, whatever word one, one uses. Our goal is to connect or reconnect consciously because we, we can never be disconnected, but to reconnect consciously uh, with that part of ourselves and grow that connection stronger and stronger and stronger until eventually um, we, we're in we're, we're in that state of consciousness, you know, where we're operating from that place rather than from our more separate, uh, lower, lower, full self state. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that was something else I was going to say, but it's, it's it's disappeared from my mind right now. That's all right, because I had two questions and I can only remember one right now. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. Whilst it's good to know, to understand, I feel anyway for me, to, to, to understand what's going on, the most important thing is to be doing the inner work to transform ourselves because then we will understand things from a much wiser perspective and then we will also be able to contribute better to the world. In, in, you know in a more authentic positive way i just had another conversation about how um doing the inner work puts you into a place where you can then contribute better to the world out there or you know while you're helping and contributing to the world out there also be doing the inner work at the same time but i was just wondering um why do you think that people are, you know, there's no judgment, there's no blame. Um, I have my opinion because I've also been through this whole experience myself, so I know what I did. But if, if you're at the point where you're um, doom scrolling or looking at things that are going wrong, but not doing the inner work, do you think that that's because people don't know or do you think that it's because um, people inside know that they should be doing it, but they're afraid? Or what do you think is the reason why, you know, we're all not we're all not busy doing it at the moment? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and I have to say, you know, be really honest that even though I, I know all this stuff and I have done a lot of study and practice, I, I don't find it easy to have my regular daily practice of going inwards. There's a lot of resistance. So either we can be t completely unaware that that level of life or, or yeah exists, we can literally be unaware, which is where I wa was when I was 28, completely and utterly unaware. And then all of a sudden this, not all of a sudden, but you know, this, this transformation and then I started to to find out about these things and read about things you know um, because of that 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 uh, shift in consciousness so a lot of people literally they're just not awake yet to, to that information uh, and secondly once we start to become awake uh, and know about it we can still have a lot of resistance to bringing ourselves internal and that has a lot to do um, from the Ren Shui perspective the lens because obviously I can only speak through what I've studied and learned through um, as a result of the, the, the unhealthy patterns of consciousness and our, and our patterns of human nature which are deeply deeply embedded at us in us at a very very deep level in our psyche uh, very unconscious, driving, driving our beliefs, our, our ways of thinking, um, our ways of operating, our behaviours. Uh, and so it takes a lot of conscious work and desire to want to change, to, to become more self-aware and, and change our habits. And for some people, you know, it will be easier than than others to do meditation practices. You know, it's it's like the stress 
system being switched on and, and it being fed all the time by the, by the drama. Um, so it feeds a certain part of us, but it's not feeding a deeper part of us. I did an <laughs> interview, I've just published it, with uh, Rain Trozy. Um, and uh, he was talking about how, for him, getting into the present moment is uh, swimming. Because when you're swimming, you, you have to focus on your breath, you have to focus on your movement, and you can feel the water on your body. Um, obviously, other ways to focus in on the present could be uh, learning a musical instrument, uh, reading books to some extent, and then, you know, classical meditation, Qigong. So may, maybe like a really good first step for people that aren't doing anything at this point would be to just try and find an activity that they can do that just brings you into the present. Would you... Would you agree with me that training yourself to be in the present is a powerful way to start? Yes. Um, and I think the breath, you know, paying attention to breathing is probably one of the easiest and fastest ways because it it changes, you know, the autonomic nervous system. It moves us from uh, a stress mode into a relaxation mode um every you know the breath connects everything inside of us uh so literally just bringing attention to our breathing and actually focusing more in the abdomen than the chest um and watching the abdomen expand and contract just literally just watching the breathing not trying to change it in any way but just watching it but very importantly we have to remember that we, we have this external focus. We, we're so used to having external focus in our everyday life with our eyes open, our ears listening, our mouth talking. And really to go inwards, we have to bring our senses inwards. So one of the first meditations that I ever learned was, was called bringing the senses inwards and learning how the outer senses are considered the children of the internal organs. So the eyes come down into the liver, the tongue comes down into the heart, the mouth comes down into the spleen, the ears come down into the kidneys, and the nose comes down into the lungs. And bringing the senses inwards, they say, to, to rest uh, and to be disciplined, the children need to be disciplined by the, the parents at least once a day. So this is, this is the most difficult thing for people is to is to bring this external focus inwards and and then start to discover the inner world which is far more exciting uh, than believe it or not than the outer world but one has to do that work to discover that um, yeah I was I was in India once and there was um... Uh, well, I have a friend there. I wasn't there, but he went to this ecstatic dance. And uh, and there was a, a lady there and she was just standing there. And he asked her why she wasn't moving. And she said, there's far more going on on the inside than there is on the outside. So what would be, uh, so I mentioned swimming. I mentioned um, um, uh, musical instruments, reading, and then, of course, classical med traditional meditation. What would be your uh, advice or tip for people to be able to start going inwards when they do when they when they have a practice? It's very easy. For example, you can go be going for a walk, and your mind is all over the place, and it's thinking about the future, and then you're worrying about this, that, and the other, which means you're in the future, in imagined reality. Or you could be replaying a conversation. So the mind is just all over the place, you know. And in Chinese. Um, um, tradition they call it monkey mind because it's hopping all over from one branch to another so one can just say stop cancel come back to the present moment and then if we're externally focused we can just go okay what am I looking at right now because we can be going for a walk and not really noticing you know uh, what what's around us you can be in the car driving down the motorway and not be noticing what's around you it's like what am I seeing right now what am I hearing right now? What am I feeling right now? Is in the air on my on my body? 
coming back to the present moment. And I have, I, and and I I started really having to. It's funny how life brings you circumstances to force you to learn, right? To force you to learn and change and grow. So often, or usually, when we have a crisis, it's because we need to learn and change something. And so a few years ago, I found myself for the first time ever in financial crisis, and I'd never, never had major financial problems. Uh, I mean, it's never been easy working for myself, but I never had, you know, been in been in debt or anything like that. And due to something that happened, um, I, I, I suddenly found myself going unexpectedly into debt. And that started triggering a whole load of deep, deep fears, survival. Uh, and really, the lesson was it was triggering some some deep unhealed trauma from from birth, uh, and uh, survival issues. Uh, trust issues and uh, you know being in debt I mean I was several uh, not several thousand I was I was actually seventy thousand dollars in debt but you know it, it built up over about three years uh, and whatever I tried uh, physically you know get more work um, get another job nothing was working outside in the physical world you know making a physical world change and then one day I sort of said to myself, okay, Kim, I, I think some inner work is needed here. Even though I already was working on, you know, healing the trauma and that sort of thing, it was like, no, something else is needed. And so I started to really implement what I'd been learning <laughs> through the Qigong training. And one of the things that we learn is to cultivate, to grow the what are called the five essential qualities of the heart. And these five essential qualities are trust, openness, love, gratitude, and respect. And I knew for me that one, my, my trust has always been, well, not now, but it used to be very low, uh, trusting myself, trusting others, trusting life. And so I thought, okay, I'm really going to have to really, really apply myself to techniques which are going to grow trust to regrow trust and one of the things I started doing was practicing being in the present moment because my mind was going wild with oh my god you know I'm going to be out on the street I'm going to be living in my car I'm going to be put in prison you know it was just going wild with all these imaginations uh, because I did have the banks on my back threatening this that and the other and I decided okay because I couldn't I couldn't think straight I was so stressed I couldn't I couldn't get on with my work because I was, you know, so stressed. The prefrontal cortex was closing down and it was like, okay, I have to, I have got to sort myself out here. So every day, you know, many, many times a day, I just trained myself to come back into the present moment. If I ever notice myself worrying or stressing or imagining, you know, this, um, negative uh, outcome and by the way one of the 10 fundamental patterns of human nature is negativity and pessimism and that happens to be one of my strongest ones uh, so I would just go cancel stop come back to the present moment am I okay right now and even though I had this debt in the bank yeah, I had a roof over my head. I still had a car. I still had food in the fridge, even though sometimes I literally would go down to the shops, I'd have $5 in my bank account and I'd be buying a $1 loaf of bread, you know. <laughs> um, you know, it was like, I'm okay. So one of my little mantras became, am I okay today? To ask myself, am I okay today? Yeah, I am. And I think this is a really useful thing for anybody right now who's going into fear and anxiety. Just ask yourself, Am I okay today? Because usually I would say we are. And another thing that I started to do was what I call my present moment mantra, which sort of a friend gave me the, the beginnings of it and then we made it into a little mantra was um, I refuse to go into the past. I refuse to go into the future. I choose to stay in the present. I'm safe in the now. And whenever I found myself being in fear, because because really it's fear, right? It's the bottom line emotion that that catches us. Whenever I found myself in fear, I would I would just go cancel. And of course, one's got to catch oneself first, because that's the thing we can be doing, thinking these thoughts for minutes and hours before we actually realize, oh my God, I'm doing that again. I'm in that habit again. I would just cancel and just say the mantra, 
and as many times as I needed that day. And through doing that and other things, you know, trust meditation and other things, I started to change my fear response and bring myself, you know, back into being in the present moment and trusting. And another another one, and this sounds counterintuitive, but it's part of the trust training, is choosing to trust, making a choice to trust, even though you're in fear. Because interestingly enough, in the Chinese medical system, um, the organ that is affected or the organs that are affected by worry and overthinking, which then becomes anxiety, is the spleen, stomach, pancreas set of organs. Because the, and, and the spleen, stomach, pancreas is, is the earth element. And the earth element is about being connected to the mother earth. It's about support and safety. So as human beings, we need to feel safe and supported uh, it's it has a, a lot to do with survival. So a lot of S words there. I always think remember with the S words, spleen, stomach. Um, so we have this earth element in our body which needs to be at ease and at peace. And the the uh, affiliated organs with the spleen, stomach, pancreas from the Chinese medicine perspective are the muscles. So if we don't feel at ease and at peaceful, then we'll have tension in our muscles. So we need to have this earth element balanced. We need to have all the elements balanced. There are five elements. Uh, we need to have them all balanced. But the earth element is the is the central element that needs where we start with if we have problems. So in order for the earth ele element to feel balanced, we need to feel mm -hmm. at ease and at peace and supported and safe. And when we have that, then we will feel trust or we could say when we trust then with the, the earth element will feel safe and supported um, as opposed to worry anxiety and overthinking which puts it out of balance so um yeah so i i did a lot of work on on trust but rebuilding this trust and choosing so one of the things that, like i was just saying before is to choose to trust it's a conscious choice I can choose to trust and the, the eventual outcome of cultivating these qualities of the heart is actually to reach unconditional trust, unconditional openness, unconditional love, unconditional gratitude, unconditional respect. And as I did this, as I, 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 instead of trying to find, you know, more work and get more money and solve, you know, my problems and pay off my debt and all that sort of stuff, I just turned inwards and started making the changes inwards. And then all mm -hmm. of a sudden, I was feeling better. Not all of a sudden, it took a few months, but I was feeling better. My, my, my brain was working again. And somehow I managed to pay that debt off. And then funnily mm -hmm. enough, I, that I've paid it off. Finally, February 2020, which was a month before the pandemic was announced, inverted commas. And as soon as it was announced, I thought, oh, that was one of the reasons I went through all of that was then to help people who are going into fear, you know, because of what is happening. It was really interesting. Well, the first thing that I, I take from that is that it, it's... Um, it's commitment, right? Like to, to do the inner work, it's going to take, for, okay. So for me, I was, I say this to people normally and just a passing comment, but I was literally three months in a hammock every day, training myself to come back to the present moment. So I was looking at the sea um, most of the time or looking at trees moving and just kept bringing myself back to the present moment. And then I just say it's neuroplasticity, because if you do that long enough, your brain will start to cooperate and will actually come back to that will, will keep you in the present. Um, and I also like to bring in a little bit of the science in there. So, you know, when we're going off, as you said, it's very often it's negativity bias. So we're worrying about the future or regretting the past and going back to the present takes us out of anxiety, takes us out of stress and things like that. But anyway, it's work. We have to do that work. Um, so I think that's kind of a, 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 a big takeaway. However, it doesn't need to be. Uh, it doesn't need to be difficult, I think. You know, I think some people 
feel i mean not that it's easy it can be a very difficult journey but i think some people are put, up, put off from even trying because um it seems like going to the gym and building up muscle you know it's going to take time it's going to take effort it's going to take so it can be daunting for people at what point would you say that it's worth it for people to start doing this do you know what i mean like is it going to be a quick noticing the difference or is it going to be a long haul journey oh i think it's unique uh, for each individual well, i don't think that that's possible to you know we're, we're all different and unique and our journey is all very different and unique it's interesting when you hear stories of you know people becoming enlightened and 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 what happened for them and then one can easily think oh well i have to do that uh, actually, as I've understood it, our journey to enlightenment is very, very unique. Um, and you're right, it is a commitment. And, and often the commitment only comes when we're faced with a serious crisis um, or uh, enough pain and inconvenience and suffering that we we can no, we know we no longer want to put up with that pain and suffering and that's how it's been for me like when i got to <clears throat> i mean the depression was a little bit different but the the chronic fatigue was i remember i'd i don't know how long had i been hmm, i can't remember i think it was after i was diagnosed for 3 months and um i i i went to the doctor and they said, we, we, there's, there's no known cause and we don't have a solution, go home and rest. And at that time, I hadn't really, hadn't really, I don't think, been getting into natural therapies at that point. And so I went, I went back to my home and I wasn't, obviously I wasn't able to work. <clears throat> I'd actually quit my job one day without pre-planning it. I just walked into work after nine months of getting more and more tired. I just walked in one day and said, I quit because I just couldn't put one foot in front of the other anymore and went home and and got up and the highlight of my day was watching the love boat it, that literally was the highlight of my day I'd come down at 10 o'clock it would be on I'd watch it and then I don't know what I did the rest of the day and then I get up the next day and watch the love boat <laughs> and then after three months the season whatever it was came to an end and I sat on the couch and thought well, what now what am I going to do now and all of a sudden, this feeling inside of me came very, very strongly of, a, of like an angry, powerful feeling of like, I refuse to live my life like this. I cannot spend the rest of my life like this, doing nothing, feeling exhausted. And I made a decision in that moment that I was going to do whatever it took to find the answer. Now, I didn't know at that time it would take me another 10 years. But I was absolutely adamant in that moment that I was going to find the answer uh, no matter how. And, and then all of a sudden I had an idea just immediately pop into my head, ring this person. And I rang that per this person, this friend. <clears throat> I hadn't known her that long. And she said, and I don't know what I said, but she said, go buy the book Quantum Healing by Deepak Chopra. So I went and bought that book and, and that was probably one of the first sort of personal development books that I ever read. And it gave me the, you know, it was like, whoa, gosh, I never thought of this, you know, lots of really good information. And so what one of the things I found with all the clients that I've worked with is that there has to be a deep desire for change or for a goal. There has to be that deep desire. Without that desire, that person is not going to get well. They're not going to change. Um, and, you know, like, I, as I said, I was forced into, um, you know, looking inside myself when I was in debt, because I, I just came to realize that, you know, it was something within me that was had created it. Um, you know, I'd created those circumstances through my own unconscious fears and patterns. And so the way to change it was going to be by changing me not trying to change the external circumstances. Um, yeah. And the other thing I wanted to add about coming back to the present moment was, um, I started to say, and then I didn't finish it was that when you go for a walk, and your mind is all over the place, uh, you know, that the series, uh, I think it's Stargate, where they walk through a gate into an, another dimension. Yeah. Well, I, when I was going walking, if I, if I find myself now, you know, 
too heady, too thinking too much. I go, right, now it's time for the now gate. And then I just mentally imagine myself walking through a portal into the now, bringing myself back into the now. Also, you mentioned before that um, this, am I okay now? And then you said, yes, I've got a roof over my head. And I know you've talked about in uh, presentations you've done for the World Council for Health. Um, perhaps now I can quickly mention also you're, you're in the Mind Health Committee for the World Council for Health. So uh, you were talking about the importance of focusing on the positive. So having a positive perspective or the glass half full. So when you say, am I OK now? You're focusing on I've got the roof over my head everything's okay right now. Um, is there anything that you'd like to mention or add about um, positivity or having glass half full perspective or anything like that? What comes to mind for me is gratitude. Because when we're worrying and fretting and anxious, etc., uh, and I love that description of worry, which is mentally rehearsing what we don't want to happen, and, and again, worry, depression is, isn't uh, an emotion per se in my books. Worry also isn't an emotion, whereas most people tend to call worry an emotion. It's not. It's a mental habit of thinking. And actually, it's there as an unconscious way to try and protect ourselves from something. But if we track back, usually we'll find it's actually we're trying to protect ourselves from feeling something. You know, so if this was to happen, how would you feel? That's what we're really afraid of. Um, but I think gratitude, the attitude of gratitude, practicing gratitude, daily gratitude, and it is one of the five essential qualities of the heart in the Ren Shui system, is just finding at least five things every day to be grateful for or when we're in a moment of fear or whatever, just cancelling, stopping, okay, am I okay right now? Okay, what am I grateful for, for right now? And we can find so many things to be grateful for. I mean, just this morning, I was on a meditation uh, with a group called um, 2025 Preparing the Way, I think they're called. Um, and they, they sort of started, I think it was started in, in Israel, Jerusalem. I'm not quite sure, but I haven't been on one of their meditation um, meetings because they have them every week for quite some time. And it's mainly because of the time of day. <clears throat> but somehow today I found I was awake and I joined. And I've discovered really severe stuff going on in Jerusalem right now where the, the new government has come in apparently three months ago and they're really clamping down on, on human rights, for example, for example, wanting to separate men and women uh, in social uh, settings. And I'm not sure what else. And I sort of went on the line to have try and sort of Google what's happening in Jerusalem. Nothing, <laughs> you know, came up on Google. Um, but the women, the people speaking on the on the on the meditation, they uh, actually live in Jerusalem, so they know what's going on. And I found myself thinking, "Whoa, I am." Even though you know I've got my challenges, I am so grateful right now um, for you know what I have. And and also we have to be grateful for what we don't have. So we can be grateful for what we do have, you know, food. In, and it's the simple things. It's like the things we take for granted, food in the fridge, petrol in the car, a, a, a bed to sleep on, friends that one can talk to, uh, just every little thing we can look around and be grateful for, but also be grateful for what we don't have. I, I, I'm not ill at the moment. I don't have this, that or the other problem, you know, at the moment. And that really changes our chemistry, literally. It changes our, our chemistry, it, it increases serotonin, it calms the mind, it calms the nervous system, and we come back into the present moment. And we also <coughs> excuse me, reconnect with our authentic self, our true self, the more we practice and cultivate these essential qualities. I could continue yeah. talking with you, Kim, but uh, it's already getting on a little bit. So I'm just wondering if... Um, well, I mean, it's 9.30 p.m. here. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering, is there any other topics or areas that you uh, that we didn't talk about that you'd like to mention? 
The only thing that I'd like to mention is the, because I'm working on it right now, is the Bigger Picture series, which uh, launches next week. Uh, and it's about helping people understand the big picture of what is going on, both from a physical plane reality level, because a lot of people don't see, you know, what is happening on a physical plane reality. They haven't joined the dots. They don't understand this bigger, I don't like the word agenda, but the, these the, these bigger plans <laughs> uh, and, and goals that a certain a uh, group of humanity <laughs> seem to have <laughs> and want for the rest of humanity, which is just seems to be quite insane. Um, but but it's going deeper than that and understanding uh, that this is part of the much, much bigger evolution of humanity over millions of years. We haven't just been here for 6,000 years like we're mostly taught in, in history. Um, there's a much bigger picture going on uh, in the scheme of things, uh, which most people have no idea of. So it's an, an introduction to helping people understand <coughs> what I call the bigger picture, because A, it gives a lot of hope. You know, when we have this understanding, this bigger perspective, it gives, it gives a lot more hope. Um, and faith and optimism that things can change. Um, I can't remember the other thing that I was going to say. Um, yeah, and and it because yeah, for me, uh, some some of the information we're going to be sharing comes from what I've been studying for the last twenty plus years, and for me, this information gave me hope personally. And this was even pre-COVID, right? This is just me going through my own personal life problems um, and, and having hope and sort of a feeling of like I can keep going because there is a bigger picture here. There's a, there are bigger reasons and it's worth keeping going. Uh, so, so that is the, the purpose of this series. So love to invite people to join. So before I ask you to share any links and everything will also be in the description as well, uh, maybe just one final question for me. From what you've explored and this bigger picture and this hopefulness of where we're going, um, do you see that uh, over the next, let's say, decade, that there's going to be very, very positive things happening on the planet? I, I don't have a crystal ball and I can't say which way we're going to go, but my feeling is that it's up to us which way it goes. And that will be determined by, you know, our level of consciousness and waking up and choosing to focus on on, on the light, on, on, uh, on yeah, because... We do create our reality, and and this is why it's so important to not keep focusing on the negative and the drama and getting caught up in it, like being caught up in a whirlwind that never one never gets out of. That's all very interesting and stimulating, uh, but not necessarily positive and beneficial, and it just keeps us in the problem. We need to bring our attention and focus to this inner work, to the inner transformation, because that... Just like I was saying, from a personal experience, I transform myself and the outer world and my circumstances changed. If we do this collectively, which is what all spiritual teachers have been saying for years and centuries and decades and whatever, is like do the inner work. You know, Sri Yukteswar saying to Yogananda, when you get up in the morning, the most important thing you do is your meditation. Everything else follows uh, after that your education you know but we've been taught no you do this other stuff first you know we, we've got to change our, our priorities and I remember a few years ago probably about five years ago uh, just for a period of a few I don't know a few weeks having this very very strong feeling inside of myself was like I've got to reprioritize what I do in my day it's no longer that I do, you know, I get up and I go, I do my work, you know, because I was very, very disciplined, you know, up nine o'clock in the office till four with, with an hour's break. I've always been very, very disciplined like that. But it's like, no, you need to reprioritize what you're doing in your day and your meditation for, for me, Qigong, 
it has to be in the diary there as a priority item. And I have to admit, I still struggle with that. And that is that is how hard it can be for us to turn our attention inwards uh, and, and from the external world to the to the internal world. So Kim, if if people would like to find out more about the bigger picture series that you're offering or the program that you're offering and the other work that you do, uh, where should people go? Well, for that particular series, they can either go to artofhealth.co.nz and go to the events page, or they can go to agelesswisdomteachings.org uh, and it will be there on the on the website. Okay, and like I said, I'll put I'll put the links to to all of your sites and everything in the description. But some people might be listening to this, for example, on Spotify or something. Are there any other any other links that you'd like to share? Sure. So the Qigong uh, website, which is about the transformation of consciousness work, is uh, DaoHealthQigong.com. So that's T A O Health Qigong, which is Q I G O N G dot com dowhealthqigong.com and then I also have the emotional alchemy academy.com which is all uh, you know how to to really transform our, our inner emotional life uh, because the ultimate goal of of working on our emotions is to get to a place where we no longer experience or very rarely experience negative emotions and that is possible uh, and I remember when I first experienced that experience this deep inner stillness inside of me where I could feel chi moving to become an emotion and then I could spiral it back to becoming nothingness. And I and that was my first real insight after many years of emotional processing work of realizing, oh my God, we eventually get to a place where we don't experience negative emotions anymore. And nobody ever told me that. I thought I'd just be having emotions all the time, you know, forever and ever. And I, I remember telling a few people my experience and people got quite upset, actually. They were saying, but I want to feel my emotions. I want to have emotions. Uh, but it's a different type of, you know, feeling that we can experience. So uh, it, 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 I, I feel that this emotional processing work is absolutely paramount. From a personal perspective, we've got to be able to manage our emotions for our own personal well-being and our personal health. But from a perspective of what is going on in the world right now, it, it, is, it is a huge uh, piece of the puzzle for, you know, things becoming better. Because can you imagine if people are not going into fear, right, and they're not being traumatized and they're not in anxiety, mm -hmm. can you imagine the difference that will have on the state of consciousness of the world? And it is a prerequisite on these levels of self-realization to master one's, what I call master one's emotions. What was the website for that one, for, for looking at the emotions and mastering the emotions? Emotionalalchemyacademy.com. And I do need to say, because I do all my own websites and some of them are a bit out of date. And <laughs> so apologies for whatever the websites look like. Uh, I don't have some fancy web designer doing my websites for me. Well, they'll all be in the description. And also you've got, I believe, the umbrella site for all of the things that you're doing would be artofhealth.co.nz or NZ. Is that right? Yeah, it's the, it's the what I call the umbrella site for the Emotional Alchemy Academy, the Dow Health Qigong, and also kimnighthealth.com, which is uh, an older website which no longer gets updated but it still sits there okay so thank you so much for talking with me and there's obviously a lot more we could have gone into um but we'll have to uh, do it again some other time and dive deeper if that's all right well thank you Robito. it's been great all right thank you so much